I'm the fifth generation on this farm. This family, I me and my dad work together. My brother helps some, and my kids help. And I worked with my granddad growing up when he was out here, and we just try to take care of everything like they would. My great grandfather bought this in the late 1930s. Been in our family since then, and uh, I've got. I helped. I was a high school agriculture teacher for 35 years in Montgomery County, and helped my dad, and then I retired from the school system, and it got to be a little more than I could do by myself, and, and I started renting part of it to Timothy, who we've met with, and his dad, and Timothy's just looking for a good way to manage his, his tobacco crop, and where he thought he could make the most dollars on his bottom line, you know, and he just decided that the snow till would be a good way to go. He could help, uh, you know, manage, help some on the weed control, limit fuel usage passes across the field, and I think he got a little uptick in his yield last, last year. I'm the first one really going into this stuff. Most of my, my father doesn't like change. I'm just trying to preserve what's here for my kids, so I try to do my best. My big reason want, wanting to go to no-till tobacco is lack of water source. On a dry year like this year, needing to irrigate, I didn't have a big supply of water to be able to use and the few places that i do we have cattle and and they got to have that water supply a lot of the years so i had done some research looking at what the university of tennessee and university of kentucky had done and to me straight no-till was a better option than strip till you didn't i didn't see where you would lose any yield where they were losing yield on strip till so that, that was my big deciding factor to try it. But I looked into converting my tobacco setter and it was gonna be about $1,000 and that's just a lot of money to spend on, a, on a something that may or may not work. Montgomery County Soil and Water Conservation District was um, given a no-till setter and crimper roller uh, by Cumberland River Compact uh, for the purpose of facilitating additional soil and water conservation. And it is our job to facilitate resources on the ground and funding for landowners to do that. And in this case, the, the grant covered usage at a reduced rate for the producers and landowners of Montgomery County and Robertson counties to increase no-till usage on the farm. And then I learned that the NRCS had a tobacco setter set up for it and then that's how, that's, uh, that's how I went about trying no-till. Well, just looking at soil structure and comparing the soil structure, even though we're in a fairly, probably maybe in a different soil type here, but really just looking at, I mean, as you can see here, this was a little disturbed at the surface after harvest. Um, and down there was, how many passes did you have with tillage down there? Three. Three, three passes. So, I mean, you still got, structure here you've got roots here even you know these are i assume the roots from a tobacco plant oh, probably, probably. Um, and so as we we move into these systems to more no-till less tillage then we create this basically soil aggregates and so we have pore spaces so obviously water is going to infiltrate better here than it would in this and so just trying to compare that getting it going at first was a bit of a, um, a task, but once you get one farmer to latch on, he carries weight within the community and we, te we try to team up with them. What Timothy had done is talk with other farmers in this area and shared that with them, which led to more phone calls. I'll probably have more no-till tobacco next year. Even being a dry year, I don't know that I'm gonna see a very much of a yield bump behind the no-till, but I'm definitely not gonna see a yield loss. And that's my biggest thing. If I don't see a yield loss and I can save the money somewhere else, like the fuel and my time, then I'll keep, I'll keep trying it, keep going. It all comes down to dollars and cents. And um, if I can't manage for soil health and make money in the short term, then, then I can't do it. Now, I feel like there is a way to do it, it's just, that time trying to figure out and how in the heck do I do it? How do I get there? I know I can, but I got to try to figure it out. And I need to try to figure it out as quick as I can before I go broke. The no-till setter is unique. Um, it has to be calibrated for each crop use. And that can sometimes be challenging. 
But uh, once you have a farmer who learns how to do that, or if you have someone that's educated in that area, applying that on the field is, is valuable. You can get back on the ground sooner and raising tobacco. Tobacco is all about timing. Um, you can come out and look at a field today, you need to spray for something or you need to do something. It rains for two days. You can't get back in the field for another three. The next thing you know, it's too late. There's already, the damage is done. There's instances where, in my opinion, no-till doesn't work. I mean, I would never go into one of my dad's pasture fields and try to no-till tobacco. I would have to go in there and break that ground up and get it mainly for her, for the weed control. But there's some, there's still instances in, in corn and soybeans where I, I can't see where no-till works. Most of the time it's in your wetter soils and wetter ground, but we, some, we have to work some of it sometimes. Especially in fields that are just corn, it's corn and soybean rotation, no wheat in the rotation, no cover crop, and it's no-till after no-till after no-till and done that for 20 or 30 years. I mean, you can really start to see some severe compaction and that's why, you know, I think wheat for grain and or cover crop either way is great for the soil in that, you know, you have X amount of months throughout the year where you're still capturing sunlight, putting carbon into the soil, those roots from that from the weed are interacting with microbes and you're aggregating soils. You're, you're making them crumbly and, and have good soil tilth. As, and then those years where you don't have wheat for grain incorporating cover crops. I don't think no-till in and of itself by itself with no winter, whether it's a winter cash crop or a cover crop, I don't think it's sustainable either. Uh, to me, it's not a whole lot better than a tillage system. But I, you know, I think soil health, whether you're involved in agriculture or not, um, it, it impacts everyone, especially here, you know, we're near the Red River um, and Red River is a, a place for water intake for, for people in this area and um, it's important to, to do our best to keep that water as clean as possible. So what we want to promote is looking at diversity and by diversity I'm talking about different, function, different species, cover crop species, and each one of those species has a different uh, function and a different purpose. Uh, there's radishes, triticale, clover, and winter peas. The radishes will help loosen the soil as they die and rot. The triticale will take up any nutrients that are in the ground left from, from the tobacco crop. And the uh, clover and the winter peas will help put a nitrogen crop in when it dies out for my next following crop. Folks like Timothy, they know the purposes of cover crops. And I feel like maybe it's it's our place to come in and, and talk about different species and how they may function uh, to just hopefully complement the management that he's already doing and, and be there to, to provide that technical assistance. But then we also rely on folks like Timothy to help us tell the story as well. Uh, you know, he's the practitioner. Uh, we're providing that assistance, but it's not our tobacco crop. We're not managing it. And so we rely heavily on folks like Timothy, those innovators that are, you know, using strip till and no-till systems and incorporating cover crops. I really rely on them to help us help others. All my farmers, the one thing they all say, they're not making any more land. <laughs> There's right. no more earth. You have to conserve those natural resources and that is the ultimate tie, soil and water conservation. And uh, anything that we can do to facilitate that is our job. The soil is, is what sustains us uh, just as people, but as growers um, in, in order to be sustainable, uh, and profitable in the future, we've got to figure out how can we be more profitable now? How can we take care of the land better? I think it's amazing what producers have, have done even in the last five to 10 years as compared to 20 or 30 years. What a much better job they do of taking care of the land. I mean, this is their livelihood, so they don't want to destroy it. I feel like in the future, as, as folks get into these systems, and I've you know seen it firsthand with others in the county, that it takes a while, but after multiple years of doing this, they can find ways to make themselves more profitable. And I think, you know, Timothy alluded to it in that, if nothing else, it was labor and fuel cost. Uh, and I know I'll also hear from other tobacco growers that have been doing no-till and even strip-till, where, you know, when we get our normal rains at, you know, 50 to 80 inches a year, um, they're like, you know, it's that much quicker I can get back on that field if it's no-tilled. And so I think that's, that's important too, just from a time standpoint. So I think it's very important. All things come from the soil. 
come to the land. The good Lord's blessed us with that. And anything you can do to limit erosion and improve the soil, improve soil health, improve the tilth consistency, texture of it, you just love to see that because, of course, crops do better. And it's, it's always a farming's like anything else, like raising a crop's like raising a family. You know, you start out with seed and watch it go to gets grown and to harvest. That's enjoyable.